Good afternoon and welcome to Walker and Dunlop's Wednesday webinar. I'm Susan Weber, your moderator. I would like to welcome Willie Walker and Jeff Blau, CEO of Related Companies. Willie and Jeff will discuss how Related is shifting its business strategy to navigate the current economy as well as the New York City market and how both New York City and other metropolitan cities will recover from the crisis. Thank you for joining us and now I will turn the call over to Willie. Thanks Susan and uh... Happy Wednesday to everyone uh, and good afternoon. Uh, if it's uh, Wednesday, it's the Walker Wednesday webinar and I'm super thankful, honored and excited to have Jeff Blau join me today. Uh, Jeff and I've known each other for quite some time and getting Jeff's uh, perspectives on the market and the world we live in today uh, will be very insightful and informative. And so um, thank you, Jeff, for joining us. Before Happy I- to be here. To before I jump to Jeff and the and and the questions that I have for him, uh, we had a really good discussion last week with uh, Andy Florence, CEO of CoStar. Uh, and before Andy and I jumped in last week, I invited Walker and Dunlop board member John Rice uh, to join me to provide some thoughts on uh, social justice in America and how corporate America is responding um, to uh, these issues today. I would. Um, reiterate something that John said last week, which was that um, time is up for random acts of diversity and that it is time for um, corporations across the country uh, to take real action and to implement real goals. Uh, as Melody Hobson um, of Ariel Investment said last Tuesday on CNBC, uh, there's not a board of directors in the country they would accept a management team saying, we'll do better on something next year. Uh, we all know how to quantify issues. We all know how to put real metrics to them. And I will just put forth that um, I was very pleased that I could share some of Walker and Dunlop's metrics on these issues with listeners last week. And to um, everybody out there who is in our industry looking for ways to make a difference, um, I would just put forth that um, platitudes as it relates to the concern over the social unrest in our country are obviously welcome and needed, um, but what's really needed is long-term action plans to make a difference on these issues uh, and make a difference to the communities um, that we all work and live in. Uh, a moment on the overall market before I turn to Jeff and get his perspectives. Uh, we all saw the jobs uh, numbers last week be better than expected in the equity markets rally. We have seen uh, the 10 year treasury move up out of a band of 52 basis points and 78 basis points to over 90 basis points um, during uh, the, core, the beginning part of this week. Um, the move up in treasuries um, actually has hit sort of the um, floor rates that many lenders had had prior uh, to the move up. And so we're now actually, for instance, on Fannie Mae, 90 basis points was the floor on 10-year treasury. So we've really only moved up to the floor, which means that the overall borrowing costs out there today are very similar to where they were um, a week ago. And we are continuing to see a significant amount of activity and volume in the multifamily market as it relates to refinancing of properties. Um, I would also say that during the month of May, we saw some activity on the investment sales side of things um, with uh, five transactions. And while that's uh, well off of where Walker and Dunlop typically would be on the investment sales side of things, it is great to see that buyers and sellers are finding a market and starting to transact um, once again uh, in the multifamily space. As we focus on opening up, uh, Jeff's views on New York are going to be um, very informative as it relates to the market that has been hit the hardest by uh, the COVID crisis. Um, I would say I've been watching the headlines that are talking about increased number of COVID cases across the country. Um, the one state that I've been watching very closely after having Governor Polis on the webcast a couple weeks ago is Colorado. And if you actually look at a state like Colorado that's now been open almost as long as any state in the country, um, what is very, very reassuring is that as their testing numbers have gone up significantly to a peak of about 8,500 tests a day, but they're averaging somewhere between four and 5,000, um, the number of positive tests has actually dropped from about 15% down to about two and a half percent. And behind all of that is number of new cases has gone from about 400 a day down to 150 a day. 
And thankfully, the number of deaths has dropped um, from a peak of 38 in the state of Colorado down to um, no deaths for two days over the last week and two or three deaths on the other days. So if you look at someone like Col a state like Colorado, the data actually looks very good as it relates to opening the economy back up and um, maintaining or controlling uh, the growth of the virus. Um, but clearly, as states open back up, um, we are going to see higher testing numbers, which invariably are going to drive higher infection rates um, coming to our uh, knowledge, if you will. Um, but really, the issue is those infections turning into hospitalizations. Do the hospitalizations ha hospitals have the capacity to be able to deal with that? And then obviously, behind all that is the morbidity rate. Um, but overall, things are looking very good um, as it relates to where the market is, as it relates to the opening of the economy. Um, and um, finally, on multifamily rent collections, many of you saw the NMHC survey data that came out for the first five days of the month of June. Uh, those numbers were better than the month of May, which were better than the month of April. And so collections so far in the month of June are tracking very well. Um, and that is a welcome early indicator that rent rolls are holding up in multifamily. Um, and clearly the number of loans that Walker and Dunlop and other lenders have that have entered forbearance um, has not been nearly as high a number as anyone had expected, um, which are all good signs. The real question is what happens when the government stimulus dollars um, that have come out of the CARES Act um, are either extended or not extended come uh, August, September, <clears throat> October, and into Q3. So um, let, me, uh, let me turn to Jeff now. Um, so Jeff, back in 2013, right after you became CEO of Related, um, you said in an interview that you did with Bloomberg, um, there are so many opportunities not to do the right thing in this business. You have to keep your moral compass. With everything that's going on in the United States right now as it relates to both the civil unrest and um, social justice, um, what are you and Related doing uh, to do the right thing? All right. Well, first, uh, thanks for having me here today. Uh, I've watched a couple of these, and I'm uh, excited to, to talk about the issues uh, we're facing. So with re regard to that question, I think the, the first thing to talk about is really Related's response to the COVID crisis. Um, you know, very early on, we realized uh, that there was an opportunity for us to really get involved in a way more than just throwing dollars at the situation. And, you know, we, we did a couple of very unique things that I, I think uh, became very helpful to the city uh, here in New York. Uh, for example, uh, when Governor Cuomo originally thought that we might be short 140,000 hospital beds, uh, he reached out to us um, and we, uh, since our construction sites were closed down, we moved, for example, uh, our construction crews from Hudson Yards, and we actually put a, brought a hospital online uh, out of an abandoned building in 10 days. Uh, we brought 700 beds online. And you know, I think um, that type of work, utilizing resources that we have to do good, um, you know, can make significant changes and, and big differences. We um, also at Hudson Yards, we set up um, one of our buildings is right across from Javits Center, which, um, as you probably know, uh, was turned into a field hospital and uh, had uh, federal uh, troops there um, uh, supporting that hospital. And we realized early on that since all the food places were closed, that the medical workers wouldn't really have any place to get food. And we opened up in our building at Hudson Yards um, in partnership with Jose Andres uh, and uh, a food kitchen called World Central Kitchen. And we utilized um, out of work uh, restaurant workers, chefs from all the Hudson Yards restaurants to staff World Central Kitchen. And we provided almost 90,000 meals over the course of uh, the time that it was that the Javits Center was open um, as a field hospital. Uh, we, took, um, we took empty hotel rooms, obviously all of our hotels were closed and we donated uh, hotel rooms for frontline workers. And so, and what, what, what was really great about doing all that type of work is that our staff, our own related employees, um, came in and volunteered to do all that work. Um, nobody had to ask, right? Nobody, nobody forced. And it, it's, you know, I, I spent a lot of time volunteering at the food kitchen with my son. And it, 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 was, just a, it was just great to see that we can, we can make a difference um, 
doing things like that. And then I guess, um, you know, obviously all the uh, racial issues that have come up um, in recent days, you know, this is recent weeks. I mean, this is really something we've been committed to for a long time. Um, and again, in our, in our own way, um, we have been trying to make a difference here. And I'll, just to give some examples, um, you know, we have for many years um, it, it tried to increase our percentage of minority contractors on our new developments. And not only have we tried to increase the percentage of minority contractors, we've invested with minority contractors to help them grow their businesses. And we've actually found, you know, it's a little bit of do good by doing good. Uh, we found that by making those early investments with contractors, those contractors uh, have become very loyal to us and we continue to do lots of repeat business. And, you know, I think that's how doing things like that, breaking the cycle of inequality um, by utilizing the resources that we have and not just throwing money at a, at a problem um, is a way that we can uniquely try to make change. Um, we, we, um, when, um, when we opened Hudson Yards, we needed to hire a thousand uh, new workers to actually staff the buildings and the properties around it. And so we decided instead of just uh, doing the conventional hiring path that we would set up a job training program and reached out to um, more minority communities to attract people to come work to Hudson Yards and train, uh, and train them in the types of work that we do and bringing kind of that customer service mentality to the new workers. And so we, 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 in our own way, we have been trying to make a difference for a long time. Having said all that, um, you know, what's happened over the last uh, couple of weeks has really shown that, you know, more needs to be done, um, you know, in our industry, not just for our company, but for the entire industry. And so um, I think um, getting more people attracted to the industry uh, doing that early on um, in, in education, um, at schools, at colleges, where we recruit uh, to make the real estate industry more attractive, uh, or actually just to inform, um, to inform black students about the opportunities um, in the real estate industry would help us overall grow the pool of qualified talent. And I think if, um, if we continue to do that over time, uh, we, will see, we, we will see tremendous change because as you know, the industry today um, is not is not particularly diverse. Yeah, I was just gonna let's let's talk about that for two seconds uh, longer. Which is, you know, you're on the graduate executive board at Wharton, and you've got a fantastic incoming African American dean and Erica James. And I would um, uh, salute you and others at Wharton for having selected her to be the next dean at Wharton. Um, but you know, last week I received a note from the dean at HBS. Um, and was actually quite shocked that for the last three decades, um, the number of African Americans at HBS has hovered in the sort of 50s, so 50 to 60 right, students right. of color, which, I mean, you think about institutions like Wharton and HBS that have put concerted effort into recruiting uh, more African American students, and that's obviously the pipeline for companies like Walker and Dunlop and related. Um, and clearly this is not a new issue. Any thoughts, Jeff, as it relates to what institutions like Wharton can do to try and get more talented African-Americans to come back, do MBAs, and then come out and into companies like Walker and Dunlop and related? Right. So um, that was part of the thinking with the dean, and I'm sure we're going to see some new programs and announcements coming out of, out of Wharton. Um, I will also say um, at my other alma mater at uh, University of Michigan, uh, we, are, we are working with the Ross School there, uh, with the business school, to implement programs to further kind of, as I was mentioning, education uh, around the industry. And so um, we're, we're working on an initiative to kind of teach students what the real estate industry is all about, get more uh, black and other minority students interested in the industry, and so, uh, and, and potentially even combine that with scholarship programs. And so I think, I think that type of early education um, is critical. There's also, you can even go earlier, and I think ultimately um, that could be beneficial. Um, there are programs like here in New York called Prep for Prep um, at the high schools or SEO even, um, where uh, job training and internships are made available. And so we've been very active in those two organizations um, 
And I think ramping up those efforts as part of kind of our commitment to change um, is something that we'll, we will definitely put in place. So everything that um, you said as it relates to related working with the state of New York and the efforts that you um, made to create hospital capacity and things of that nature are absolutely fantastic. Um, I went to Tribe the Tribeca Tower um, website, uh, which I believe Tribeca Tower was one of the first developments that you actually worked on uh, at Related. And, and um, as I was looking at it, I was um, immediately impressed with the, with the pop-up screen as it relates to um, Related doing your part to keep your tenants safe. And it had details on, you know, cleaning, employee monitoring, um, airflow, elevators, such as you know, implementing nanotechnology buttons, um, package delivery, and using the related app. Um, talk about COVID as it relates to specific things you've implemented at your properties, and both, um, <clears throat> both the successes as well as some of the future challenges that you see, Jeff, as we continue to open up the economy and as people both live in your buildings and then also head back into offices and start to interact with people in offices and retail spaces that you all own and manage. Right. So we, we have, I've learned more about cleaning technologies um, in the last couple of weeks than I maybe ever wanted to know, but um, we have implemented uh, tremendous protocols for each of our buildings to return back to work. And so um, you mentioned residential, on the residential side, um, we actually uh, created an entire brochure around kind of the new protocols and benefits that we put in place, um, effectively return to home. Um, because in many of the urban markets in which we have apartments, people have left their apartments and, and gone to other locations, like as, as I could see you are now um, not in, in, in your office. And so the idea is is for companies when, when they go back to work and open their offices that people return back to their apartments in the urban centers. And what, you know, th there's obviously trepidation. People are nervous about coming back to work and people are nervous of going back uh, to the urban centers. And so what we tried to do is put in place protocols and you mentioned uh, some of them, certainly extra, extra cleaning um, and depend for our employees, uh, COVID testing, temperature checks, um, obviously wearing uh, PPE, um, elevators, spacing, uh, plexiglass at the, at the front, um, certain uh, rules around uh, package deliveries. Um, we also realize that some of the amenities that people have come to um, enjoy around their buildings are now not open. And so uh, we actually uh, invited uh, some out of work chefs again uh, from Hudson Yards and we hired them to provide home cooked meals um, in each of our residential buildings. And so we have a, a home chef available in our apartments. So we're doing some unique things. And we, on the apartment side, we worked with Mount Sinai uh, Hospital to um, uh, really codify all of these protocols. And we're actually providing um, on site uh, COVID and antibody testing for any resident that uh, wants to do that. On the office side, it did involve um, in a, a return to office protocols that we put out did involve a greater use of, of new technology. So in all of our office buildings, uh, we have new thermal scanning equipment installed in the lobbies. Um, we are requiring all of our tenants to have their employees uh, do temperature checks at home and fill out a, a survey or a questionnaire every day before they come in confirming that they haven't uh, been in, in contact with anyone that has COVID, that they don't have COVID, that they took their temperature. Uh, we're also working with our tenants to stagger start times uh, so that the lobbies are not, are not that busy. Uh, we do have the dots on the floors and, and things like that to show uh, acceptable social distancing. Our uh, turnstiles um, are touchless, so you can wave your hand over a turnstile. Uh, it'll allow entry. It will also tell you uh, which elevator to take and call the elevator so you don't have to touch the buttons. Alternatively, you can call it on your iPad. So we're trying to make the whole experience um, as friendly and easy to use um, customer service you know, forward as possible uh, to really make people comfortable going back to the office. And uh, so far, we've had a, a tremendous response from our tenants as they gear back up um, to go to work. How comfortable are you personally in heading back into the office and, and where's related as it relates to your company getting back into the physical office? 
Yeah, so we've talked a little bit about this. You know, I I um, I am very comfortable. I'm in I'm in the city uh, now. Um, the governor in New York, I believe, is going to open uh, phase two, which would allow return to office on June 22nd. And related is going back full force um, on June 22nd. I'll be there, and my entire team will be there. And you know, I think there's there's two reasons uh, because that's I would I, I I know where you're headed with this, and that's not probably the majority of, of people right now. Um, first, you know, we have about 4,000 employees across the United States. About 60% of our workforce worked all the way through, um, either in buildings um, or on construction sites as, as essential workers. And I just, I believe that it's important that if they, uh, if our work, if our field uh, workers are doing their job throughout this, that if the corporate office, you know, can be open, that we need to be there to support our team. And so we are all going to going to uh, be back as soon as possible. I think um, in a, a, another very very important reason, and, and you know, I've seen a little of, of this from my peers and other CEOs in New York and, and around the country, is there's been a little bit of an attitude of, you know, maybe I'll just take a slow return and I'll let my employees come back um, maybe after Labor Day um, and kind of have a slow summer. You know, I, I think I think our cities have been hit with with you know something pretty traumatic, and um, you know the restaurants and the retail stores are all suffering. And we need to go back. Uh, we need to go back to work. Everybody, I believe, needs to return you know to their offices and and kind of get it started again. Because otherwise, those restaurants, the the coffee shop that you go on the way to, to the office, the card store. And, you know, whatever it is, those things rely on all these office workers. And, you know, I, I, I think, you know, I'm on the, the board of the New York Partnership. And, you know, we've been talking about, you know, creating a campaign around New York is open for business, right? We, you know, come back to New York. And I, I think um, that's a campaign that many cities are going to have to go through now. And I think the sooner we can all get back to work, uh, the better, it, you know, it'll be for those economies. So that's a pretty good segue to your, your landlord um, on residential, on office, and on retail, as well as hospitality. Um, talk about um, the overall health, if you will, of those asset classes and where you are from a collection standpoint um, a, a, across the spectrum there. Um, what's, what, what's holding up well? And if you would, Jeff, let's go from office to uh, uh, retail and then we'll end with multifamily because I want to dive a little bit deeper on the multifamily side given the breadth okay. of your ownership and um, portfolio on the resi side. So if you could go office then re uh, retail and then we'll end with resi. I'll go deeper on resi once you've given us some numbers there. Right. So I mean what I'd say it, uh, on office is um, I think there's going to be a tale of two cities in that sector. Um, so I think I think um, the class A buildings have held up tremendously well. I mean, literally to 100% collections. Um, and, I, and I think there's, a, there's, there's several reasons. I mean, one, the newer buildings typically have, you know, large credit tenants in there that can afford to make the rent payments um, and have made rent payments for the most part. There are some bad actors out there, but for the most part, um, they've made their rent payments. Um, the, the class A buildings typically have you know, large lobbies that it can accommodate all these new uh, technologies and, and separation that's required. They typically have uh, large high-speed destination dispatch elevators that you don't have to touch and have lots of room in them. Um, and they typically have, um, you know, brand new HVAC systems where you can dial up or dial down fresh air circulation and, and other, other ways to make sure that things are clean. And they, they typically have healthy um, kind of expense budget so they could afford to bring on the extra cleaning staff and PPE that's required. So I think that they, I think that class A buildings come through this very strong, um, you know, with little to no change. Um, and, and also, you know, there's, there's a question you know, that everyone likes to talk about, you know, what's the future of office? Is everyone going to work from home? Are people going to go back to work? I think people at the end of the day, we've gotten used to this technology and it actually has been an incredible tool. We've all been able to run our businesses while this has happened. But I think this is a terrible way to operate a, a company. Um, the, 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 the loss of culture, uh, the lack of innovation, the lack of creativity, um, 
I think is ultimately takes its toll on companies. Um, how do you hire new people and get them to understand your culture on Zoom? It's, it's very difficult. And so um, I do think people are gonna go back to the office. And in fact, those companies in the class A buildings um, they have already reached out to us and said that they need more space, right? Because they were either in trading floors or bench seating and those companies can afford to do something about it because the last thing that, you know, a fortune one 500 company wants to do is tell its employees that they need to come back in bench seating right now. And so I think there'll be more demand from that sector. Go to the other side where right? you have the class B buildings, you've got lower credit tenants that may not be able to pay. They've got small lobbies. They've got small elevators. Um, they have smaller companies in there um, that may have to do more work from home because a they think it works, or b they can't they can't afford to keep as much space as they as they could. So, you know, people ask me all the time. You know, what, like for example, all these office REITs, the stocks are down, and so on. Is that a good buy or not a good buy? I don't think there's one answer. I think you really need to study who has newer buildings versus older buildings. And, and I think there's gonna be uh, real differentiation in those markets. Um, on, uh, would you wanna retail, ne retail yeah, next? Yeah. yeah, so on retail, um, it's also a little bit of kind of tale of, of a couple different cities. Um, so retail has been probably one of the hardest hit sectors, uh, obviously hotel may be slightly worse, but uh, you know, retailers have been going through change for a long time, um, you know, people say this all the time, but I think we are, we are really seeing acceleration of trends that were happening. Um, and so uh, many of the retailers are not gonna make it through this. Obviously, Neiman Marcus filed, JCPenney's, J. Crew. Um, my guess is that there's many more. Um, and so I think ultimately we have too much retail in this country. Um, you know, we, we're both uh, friendly with Bobby Taubman, if you ask him. Uh, we've heard him say this over and over again. There's 1,200 malls in this country. He thinks that there should only be 300, and of those 300, only 100 ever make any money. Um, and so that's a, a dramatic change to the retail landscape. Um, so I think, I think this will accelerate some of that. Um, the, my biggest concern are the small retailers, right? So uh, restaurants and local shops that make um, you know, certain, certain places like Hudson Yards and Time Warner Center are very unique to New York. Um, and, you know, we are doing everything that we can to make sure those restaurants and small shops um, make it through this and stay in business, while at the same time really pushing our credit tenants to pay their rent and make sure that they're doing what they, you know, their share and doing what they're supposed to be doing to uh, get through this. So, uh, you know, in terms of numbers, I think the numbers in the, in the mall rates have been hovering around 20% collections. Um, we've averaged about 40% in our urban centers. Um, now, what's interesting, we have a whole nother group of retail that we call boroughs or big box retail, you know, which uh, typically has Home Depot, Target, TJ, food. Uh, a lot of that has been open throughout this. Um, and so uh, as essential, essential workers, essential companies, and we've been collecting 70 plus percent all the way through in that type of center. So um, again, it's a, it's a little bit, you know, I, I hate to answer just how's retail. I think it's, you know, geographic based and, and asset type based. Jeff, you talked a moment ago about how I think successful uh, your product is gonna be in the office space given its newer product, its scale, its size, its finish, all the things that are gonna bring people back into the office. Um, and I, and it, it, it's, it all makes perfect sense to me. When you think about the fit and finish on a Neiman Marcus and Hudson Yards and the amount of capital that was invested there, what are you and your team thinking about if that space has to be repurposed? What, what can that type of a space turn into? Uh, does it go to, does it remain retail? Does it get turned into office? What, what have you all been looking at as it relates to if there are failures as there clearly have been announced um, and space is given back to you, what can you do with that physical space? Right, so we have at Hudson Yards, we have, we have about 700,000 feet of rentable uh, retail space um, in that center. Uh, Neiman's is probably 30, 35% of that, of that space. 
Um, they, as you know, they did file. Um, they have not told us if they're accepting or rejecting the lease, you know, at this point. So we don't have any more information, but um, if it were to head down the path that they were uh, not going to reopen, and I, I don't, I don't, I don't know the outcome of that yet. Um, we would probably look to convert that to office space because the office market has been very, very strong. Um, and I ultimately think um, department stores uh, are not the attraction that they used to be. I mean, in, in days past, you would never open a mall or center without an anchor department store. And, you know, that that was the formula for every mall across the country. Um, today, I actually don't think they're that, um, they're that important. And I think things like retail and fitness and, you know, Whole Foods become much more of a track, much more uh, anchor attractions um, than, than department stores. And, you know, if we were to convert the Neiman's and, and put a uh, tech company in there with 2,000 employees, I think the traffic generated from the incremental office space um, would bring much more business to the retailers down below than even a, 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 a different department store, if there even was one, to take that kind of space. So, um, you know, I'm still, I'm very bullish on uh, ways to kind of repurpose centers, um, you know, even even the malls that are now going to have closed department stores, uh, you know, typically they were um, end caps on wings of the malls. And I think um, the opportunity to close those down and, and build apartment buildings or suburban office around those malls, remember the malls were based in the center and communities grew around them. So they're, they're typically in great locations. Um, so I think there's, I think there's good business to be had there. If you, if we're talking about smaller retailers, um, related, um, owns Equinox as well as SoulCycle. And I love the, the, if you will, fitness focus. And you just talked about, um, fitness being such an important component of not only the office environment, but also the retail environment. Um, what are your thoughts as it relates to the reopening, um, Equinox, uh, and SoulCycle as it relates to usership? Um, if you if you look at things like Peloton stock uh, price, Peloton obviously has benefited uh, dramatically um, from the uh, stay at home orders. Um, and I would put forth that, you know, the idea of people going back into a soul cycle studio where you're really kind of shoulder to shoulder with the person on the bike next to you is probably not what most people right now are envisioning is sort of the ideal workout experience. So uh, what's similar to sort of how you deal with a space like an Marcus that might need to be repurposed? What's the thought at Equinox and soul cycle as it relates to what the new normal looks like? Right. Um, so. I would say a couple of things, you know, in terms of, of fitness in general, I think post COVID, um, I think the demand for uh, fitness, wellness will be greater than it's ever been. I mean, I think it's been proven um, in this pandemic that those that were uh, healthier um, had better success in, in fighting this virus. And um, I think it is really pointed out, um, you know, the, the state of kind of health in our economy, uh, in, in our society. And um, I think there's going to be a renewed emphasis on that. And so I think there's actually going to be more demand for working out and staying healthy um, post. The issue obviously is how do we make these spaces safe for our members, for Equinox's members? Um, and Equinox has launched, you may have seen online, tremendous kind of safety and kind of return to uh, the health clubs, the fitness club uh, protocols including very similar things to uh, what we're doing in the office buildings, uh, temperature checks and filling out uh, online on, the, on their app, questionnaires and spacing and PPE. Uh, we opened, uh, Equinox opened in Texas uh, last week, uh, two weeks ago now. Um, and we are, uh, they are back to essentially almost uh, pre-COVID usage levels um, in the club spaced out by time, but in terms of people per day, um, and so uh, we, we were very excited to see that SoulCycle also opened there. Now in SoulCycle, we had to do, as you suggest, uh, s uh, more separation of the bikes and so following the six foot rule and so on. So we've limited capacity in the studios and we, the SoulCycle studios that have opened are completely sold out, um, you know, days in advance. And, and we've, we've added more classes to kind of allow the same number of riders, but over multiple classes. So they're not as packed in. So there will be changes to the business model. Um, 
de-densifying kind of the usage, uh, in some cases possibly requiring reservations. Um, but everybody's going to have to change their business model a bit. I think when we get to the other side of uh, this pandemic and a vaccine is here, I think, um, you know, the, as I said, the interest in, in Equinox um, and health and wellness is going to be greater than ever before. So uh, I'm pretty optimistic about, about the future there. Jeff, there are a lot of people who've been trying to sort of figure out urban versus suburban. We've clearly seen over the last uh, decade a real urban migration uh, across the country where um, not only have companies moved from suburban locations to urban locations, but people have sought an urban setting and particularly young, well-educated Americans have migrated to the urban core. Um, right now, given COVID, there are lots of people who are sitting there saying, where are things going to go from here? Are people going to want more space and move out of multifamily to single family? Are people going to want to get out of the densification that exists in the urban core and move out to suburban communities, whether that's in a single family or a, a multifamily setting? What's your thought given where Related has been investing across the country as it relates to that sort of urban-suburban trade-off decision? Do you think that, that the, the, if you will, the brains and the investment continue to go to the urban core? Do you think we start to see some more migration out to suburban communities and suburban office? Right. So, look, I, I think, um, you know, our, our, our chairman, Steve Ross, always likes to say, you know, when things are bad, um, you can never think about how they're going to get good. And when things are good, you can't, you can't imagine how they're going to get bad. And I, I think, you know, I, I often think about that. Um, and I think there's a, often a lot of overreaction in bad times. And so you're seeing, you know, everybody say, oh, I'm going to move out of the city. I'm going to move to the suburbs, you know, and all, people projecting that uh, suburban home prices are going to go through the roofs. I actually don't think that's going to happen. Um, there might be a little bit of that in the short term as we, as we, kind of get to the other side of this vaccine. But there's a reason that people have been moving to the cities um, for the past 20 plus years, right? People love to be in cities. People like to be around people. People like to go out to restaurants and go to music clubs. And, um, you know, it's a place where art and culture come together um, and that intellectual talent resides. Um, and that's why companies ultimately, you know, have moved headquarters and continue to move into cities. So I think there's going to be this period, 12 to 18 months, um, where people are kind of feeling their way back into the cities, and there might be, you know, more usage of the of the suburbs, you know, as people are, are might be on half shifts in their office, 50% working. So I think I think there'll be a little bit of that, but ultimately, um, those all those reasons that people love cities um, still hold true. Um, and will hold true post-vaccine. And, and, you know, I think um, that these cities are going to come back. You know, people, um, you know, New York has been kind of one of the great cities of our, you know, around the world. And, and uh, you know, I would say don't ever bet against, against New York. So on that, if you think about um, sort of the COVID crisis and where it's hit both states as well as cities, um, on your, you know, your portfolio on the resi side is is very concentrated in um, uh, the major U.S. cities, and in many instances, if you will, um, in blue states, uh, you know, New York, Massachusetts with Boston, uh, Illinois with Chicago, California with L.A., San Francisco, and D.C. Uh, and we've clearly seen the COVID crisis put significant pressure on um, not only the city budgets, but the state budgets. Um, as we think about opening back up and as we think about <clears throat> where Related has significant properties, um, what's your take on sort of that, I, I don't mean to put it into political terms of blue versus red, but that has sort of been a, a delineating line. And, and more importantly, I guess, Jeff, is um, government revenues and, um, in, and taxes as it relates to if, if we're running up big deficits right now on a state basis and clearly at the federal level, um, what does that mean as it relates to tax, rate, tax rates and what does that mean as it relates to um, population base going forward in some of these big cities where related has made very significant bets? Right. 
So I'm going to take that and combine it with a little bit of your last question about people going back to the cities. Um, you know, again, I think that there had already been in place kind of a trend to advance to what had historically been called secondary cities, you know, whether it's Austin or Denver or uh, Charlotte um, or even slightly suburb cities a little bit. Um, so, for example, we are um, still in California, but we are building, we're about to start construction in Santa Clara, um, you know, right outside of San Francisco on a uh, 13 million square foot uh, development on 250 acres that we own there right across from the 49er stadium. And, you know, if you think about that market, um, it, it's, it's the home to Apple, Facebook, and Google all around us. And, you know, I, I think those businesses, the tech companies, um, you know, have come out of the COVID situation, you know, probably stronger than ever before. And so um, I think, um, you know, for us, it's not just an, a focus on those, you know, couple of urban centers, but I think doing something that's a little bit more, uh, less vertical and, and more uh, spread out over, over, but still creating a, 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 a city center, a main street, um, where we will have office, retail, residential, hotel, um, restaurants, um, as a as a main street in a kind of suburban type location, semi suburban type location, um, I think is a way for us to kind of go to other areas and continue to create great places like we've done in the urban centers. Um, <clears throat> we also, um, as you as you know, we we have rolled out the Equinox Hotel concept, um, and kind of with that, we we have used that to anchor. Um, developments in, you know, Austin, uh, you know, a city that we have, hadn't typically uh, developed in before. Um, Dallas was on our, is on our list. Uh, San Francisco as a site. Um, so I think Nashville is certainly a place that we're going to look to bring that product. So I think um, it, it allows us to enter a market with, with a brand and a concept that's a real differentiator uh, because you know, it's very hard, you know, to sit in New York and say, oh, I'm going to develop in Nashville and do this and kind of you show up. There's a lot of smart people there that have been doing it for a long time. Um, and so, you know, just because, you know, we're a bigger, a big company, it doesn't mean that you're automatically successful there. You have to really do something that's going to make us stand out. And so, um, you know, that that was really our way to differentiate our product in those markets. And uh, once we kind of get over to the other side of this COVID situation, we're going to continue to pursue those markets because I think I think there's there's going to be some great opportunities there as well. The Equinox Hotel concept is one that I absolutely uh, love. Uh, given the weakness at the at the high end on the hospitality side, um, are you all basically moving forward with those development plans on those sites you have, or are you doing more of a let's wait and see how things uh, you know kind of move right. forward, particularly given that you yeah. just opened up your Equinox Hotel in Hudson Yards, uh, which I'm assuming has gotten you know hit extremely hard during this downturn, and we'll see how it comes back up. What's the what's your view as it relates to the rollout on Equinox? Right. Well, as you know, I'm generally optimistic about most things, uh, but this is a tough one. Um, the hospitality sector, I think, is going to is going to uh, suffer for a while. Um, you know, Equinox Hotel at Hudson Yards opened up to incredible success and reviews. Um, I mean, really on a roll. And you know, just to watch it every day being closed, um, it, it it kills me a little bit. But um, look, I I think um, you know, like I said, I as strongly as I felt that people are tired of kind of all this zoom stuff and will return back to their office, you know, pretty quickly. I think there will be hesitation. Um, you know, I would jump on a plane for an hour meeting across the country, you know, on a moment's notice, typically. Um, I think there's going to be hesitation, uh, to do that for a while and, and use the airlines and stay in hotels. Um, and I think people will now so familiar with this technology say, Hey, I can, I can avoid that trip and, and do a zoom call. Um, you know, I, I ultimately think it, it comes back, but I think it is a much more delayed response than, than the office situation. Um, and so we, uh, we have uh, downtown Los Angeles underway uh, with an Equinox um, and a couple others, um, you know, pretty far along. But we're going to see, uh, we're going to see how fast that comes back uh, before major expansion there. So we've talked about related really having an incredible 
not only portfolio, but brand at the high end of the market, whether it be in office, retail, or multifamily. Um, but you all also are an absolutely huge and fantastic owner and operator of affordable and workforce housing in the multifamily space. You've got, I think, over 60,000 units in that portfolio. Um, first of all, hats off to you and related for having been such a big supplier and owner of that asset class at a time when it's more needed than ever. Um, how are the fundamentals in that sort of segment holding up as it relates to rent collections? And then what's your outlook as it relates to uh, the focus between <clears throat> the luxury brands that you all have been so successful at developing recently, and then sort of that core affordable and workforce housing mandate that Related has carried for as long as Steve has you know, had the company? Right. So you're right. I mean, Stephen founded the company on, on the affordable housing business and, um, you know, it is at our core. It's part of our culture. Um, you know, we are today one of the largest owners of affordable and continuously invest um, in preservation of affordable housing and new development of affordable housing. Um, it's where we have created uh, lots of opportunities um, in minority communities. Um, in terms of providing affordable housing, in terms of hiring workers from those communities, in terms of construction in those communities. And, you know, as you said, it's, it's more important now than ever. And uh, we have an, a, a renewed or an increased emphasis on that um, today uh, coming out of, of recent situation. And, and so, um, you know, I, I think it's one of the biggest issues facing our country and the cities. Um, and so, um, we are working with governments, both federal, state, and local governments to, you know, help increase funding towards um, those initiatives and uh, using uh, sometimes non-cash benefits to make things happen, whether they're uh, uh, density bonuses and, uh, that, that uh, cities can use to allow um, more development of, say, adjacent market rate housing, whether it's um, conversion of housing authority properties from old um, kind of out of service buildings into new modern affordable housing. Um, so these are things that uh, we definitely focus on and continue to focus on. Um, we, we also have developed a fair amount of workforce housing, which is that middle area, um, kind of not traditional affordable, but uh, workforce housing, police, teachers. Um, and, and I think that's another critical component that cities are missing. And, and um, you know we will continue to do that. With with regard to um, the the luxury portfolio, you had asked me once, you know, does branding uh, can you really differentiate um, in in our in in the luxury uh, space with market rate? And you know we have been very very successful in doing that. Um, you know about probably 15 years ago, you know we sat down and realized that we had enough economies of scale to actually create a brand. Uh, and that's that's not typical in the multifamily space. There's normal, you know, typically you've got a XYZ, not particularly, you know, great name, Glenn's Landing or some other name of, of a multifamily property. It doesn't well, really mean you anything. Should our, you should see our portfolio, Jeff. It's filled <laughs> right, with a lot of right. all those all those things: landing, sales, place. Um, and so, you know, we realized that we could really create a brand, um, and we did that with our related rentals brand and uh, and then our reserve collection where we really, um, by increasing uh, amenities in the building, but not just, um, not just you know, another room, uh, you know, a, a gathering space, but we program and we, we host events, we, we create community within our buildings, um, whether it's you know, wine tasting or um, educational or kids programming. Um, and we've gotten a tremendous response uh, to that. And whether it's staffing, uh, we bring all of our uh, building residents through customer service training. And the idea was that if you lived in a related rentals building, it's essentially like living in a Four Seasons. And um, all the typical hotel services and training that went into a Four Seasons employee is what we do um, on the residential side. So, um, you know, if, uh, if you get off the elevator and the porter is vacuuming the hallway, you know, the, the, what that porter is supposed to do, turn the vacuum off, stand aside, say good morning or whatever it is. All those little cues are things that we have we have taught and trained our, our staff to do, and uh, I do think that we get a, a premium in those buildings um, for that. Um, so, 
in 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 terms of rent collections across the portfolio, I, you know, like the other assets we talked about, I think it really does um, vary by product type. Um, so the the uh, market rate, our high end market rate product, has held up extremely well. Um, people in those buildings um, typically have high credit scores and have savings, and uh, for the most part, have kept their jobs. Um, and so we've you know collections have been ninety five plus you know percent uh, during this period of time. In the affordable space, uh, you have a, an interesting dynamic in that a large majority of the rent is paid through government subsidies, whether they're Section 8 or local subsidies. And so um, fortunately, the government is still making payments. And so we've been able to collect all that. And that's, that's somewhere around 75, 80% of our affordable revenue, uh, rent, rent that we get. So it's really the 20%. And, and even in the 20%, you know, I think we were somewhere in the, in the mid-70s collection. But if you take mid-70s on 20 and 100 on 80, you wind up back you know, in a pretty good place. So the, you know, the softest spot we probably had was in the, the workforce component. Um, yeah. So I would say in there, um, it's unsubsidized. And um, at least the rents are, are typically unsubsidized. The, the, the developments are often subsidized. Uh, but the rents are not. And um, I'd say our average income in those buildings probably uh, 80 to $100,000. And, um, you know, there's where you had a lot of job losses. And so, you know, we were, our collections were down, um, you know, in the 80s in, in that segment. So uh, not terrible. Uh, we, we are working with all of our tenants that have been affected by COVID. And uh, again, hopefully these were furloughed positions that ultimately come back and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll kind of get back to business in the next month or so. Similar to your, uh, my, my question as it relates to the Equinox Hotel and, and what you see happening in the hospitality sector, uh, COVID hasn't only impacted the United States, obviously, it's impacted the world. Uh, Related's been making a number of investments recently outside of the United States. You've got a joint venture in the UK with Argent and you've got a, a, another uh, big venture in the Gulf region. What's your thought now, Jeff, as it relates to international expansion of Related versus sort of, if you will, uh, focus in the United States where there's still plenty of opportunity for you. What's your, what's your take on domestic versus international given what we're seeing across the globe, not only the COVID crisis, but just sort of uh, economies around the globe and who kind of comes out of this uh, looking either better or worse than they did heading in? Right. So, I mean, we, we, we have historically been uh, pretty domestic focused, um, as you mentioned, um, we did do a couple of things and uh, we, we, we did a, a big retail center in Abu Dhabi in partnership with one of our investors. <clears throat> um, but we, in London, we actually opened up an office. Um, I mean, one of the things that, you know, when I think about expanding and, you know, we have offices now uh, throughout the U.S., in New York, Chicago, L.A., San Francisco, Boston, D.C. And then, you know, London was a place that we always saw a great opportunity um, and, and thought it to be a city very similar to New York that we knew so well. And we saw all these deals come in and, and you know, we'd go run over there and go look at a deal. And, you know, but ultimately when we open these offices, it's always about people first, it's not deals first. And so we passed on many deals in, in London um, that we thought were, were good deals, but we didn't feel that we were properly prepared with people. Um, and, and ultimately this is a, this is a, this is a people business that we're in. And if you don't have the right people in place, I don't, it doesn't really matter how good the deal is. And so um, we were fortunate. We had the opportunity to acquire a company called uh, Argent. Um, that was a spinoff of uh, two uh, pension funds in London. And the management team joined us. And, and now, you know, I think it's, um, they were the original developers of King's Cross in London. Um, and, you know, now we have 130 uh, professionals in London, uh, super talented, uh, building Facebook and Google's headquarters as part of King's Cross. Um, and, and with that team, uh, we have really embarked on a program to build workforce housing for, for Brits or Londoners, um, as opposed to very high-end luxury housing. There is a tremendous housing shortage in London. Uh, we have about 13,000 units in the pipeline now and many of these will be institutional for rent product, another, uh, another product that's unusual in that market. Um, 
most uh, most product is for sale or individual uh, units that are owned owned by individuals that are then rented. And so the idea to bring our kind of uh, luxury customer service driven uh, market rate housing product to London and go into that market was something that you know we think is very attractive and you know because of the price point that that we're looking to compete in there I think um, we'll be less affected by kind of any uh, short-term downturn in the economy and I, I'm very very uh, positive about about continuing operations there. As we start to wrap things up, Jeff, um, you talked about teams. Um, you uh, have a lot of uh, both knowledge as well as, uh, um, if you will, uh, interest in uh, two teams particularly uh, because Steve owns the uh, Miami Dolphins and uh, your alma mater, Michigan, has a uh, uh, typically fantastic football team. Will we see the Dolphins and the Michigan football team uh, playing football this fall? And uh, if so, are you going to be in the stands or are they going to be playing in stands that don't have any fans in them? Uh, now that's a rough question with a lot of inside <laughs> information. But um, <laughs> I, I, I'll just give you a, a uh, my own opinion. Uh, as, as, so don't take this as an official statement from, from the NFL. But um, I, I would guess, and I think that there's a movement for football to be played. And my guess is that there won't be, uh, there won't be people in the stands uh, this year, both, both in Michigan and, um, and, you know, and, and the NFL. But again, that's my opinion. Um, that's not an official statement. And um, I, think, I think it'd be great to get um, sports back on TV. I think people are, are dying to watch live sports. And, and um, I think if the players and, and the networks can figure it out, that you know, that's what, what will most likely happen. Given the rivalry between Michigan and Notre Dame, um, I know it's going to be hard for you to give Notre Dame props, but I, I would say the, the leadership that Notre Dame took on saying that they were going to open back up in the fall for uh, the fall semester, I think is, is, was a somewhat of a tipping point. If we look at sort of schools opening back up and, and, and getting both university students back to universities and then hopefully uh, secondary schools back uh, in the fall. Any thoughts as it relates to schools reopening and, and, and the University of Michigan reopening? Um, again, my, my opinion, not an official word, but uh, um, I do think um, they are trying very hard to get those schools open, um, but they are definitely planning for uh, a, a, a situation where there's a combination of remote learning and and in person, so um, I wouldn't be surprised if large lecture halls are done remotely or by Zoom, um, and um, smaller classes happen in person. I think that type of combination will occur. I also think that they're going to, um, and this is not just Michigan. I think many schools will look at um, uh, eliminating the breaks, so there's less travel back and forth, and so you might. You might go until say Thanksgiving, and then and then it ends from there, but not and not have that break and make it up. So, um, I think school will I think school will happen, uh, but I think it's going to be a different a different setup uh, next year. Notwithstanding what sounds like extremely good positioning for related, oh, clearly there will be specific assets that might not have the rent collections that one would hope for, or um, a uh, retail property that has some uh, a weakness to it. But what's your thought, Jeff, as it relates to what we're gonna see in Q3 and Q4, as it relates to the overall commercial real estate industry? And I know um, it's, a, it's a broad question, but do you think that we've seen sort of the worst as it relates to the impact of COVID, uh, or do you think that there's sort of a slow burn taking place here as we move through the rest of this year with potential defaults on debt and um, kind of a reshaping of the industry into 2021 and 2022? Right, no, I, I definitely think um, there's gonna be some more pain to come. <clears throat> um, you know, the, the uh, PPP programs are expiring uh, many of our tenants have been in the industry have been relying on that. Um, you know, most of the uh, commercial lenders, uh, you know, have entered into forbearance agreements, you know, with borrowers that needed it. Um, and so nobody's really uh, had to had to battle with their lenders yet. And, and you haven't really seen 
any major defaults or foreclosures. Um, I think uh, those forbearance agreements will expire and there will be troubled assets. Um, so I think, um, I think it's yet to come. Uh, you know, we set up um, about, well, in the, last, in the last downturn, 2009, uh, we formed a company called Related Funds Management to really uh, do just that, just this is really to focus on uh, opportunities that came out of the last downturn in, in the real estate sector. And, you know, we, we really, when we started that funds business, it was all about utilizing our skills, our, our, our people, our resources as an operator developer to, uh, to create execution opportunities. So we, we probably bought, you know, half or more of the, uh, half-built buildings in the United States during the last downturn in our funds business, and um, it was it was because you know we had this great team that we had an ability to execute. It's very easy for a bank to foreclose on a over-leveraged office building because they know how to operate it. It's another thing for a bank to foreclose on a, a construction loan on a half-built building where they have 200 people working, and you know what do they do the next day and we started getting all these phone calls, you know, would you help out? Would you help us out? You know, can you take this over? And inevitably that business plan would require capital. And so we, um, we realized early on that there was an opportunity. And so our funds business um, now manages almost $8 billion of capital. We just did a big uh, capital raise fund three. And, um, you know, we, we um, I think there's gonna be a lot of opportunities in that space. I am sure there will be, and I'm sure that you and your team will um, uh, do very well. And I don't want to say take advantage of the situation because no not one take might, advantage, right? Not taking advantage of anything, but I'm sure that you all will be able to execute and also, quite honestly, provide capital to the market that is very much needed. Um, Jeff, it's been a pleasure. It's great to see you. I'm glad to see that you're doing well and that you're healthy and that your family's healthy. And uh, uh, thanks for all your insights today. Uh, to those of you who joined us, um, thank you for taking an hour out of your day and out of your week to uh, tune in. And um, I hope everyone um, stays safe and healthy. And thanks again, Jeff, for joining me today. Great. Thanks for having me. Take thank care. Bye-bye.